welcome to another episode of Métis Time Capsule. I'm your host, Alexandria Anthony, and I hope these episodes show everyone the diversity of our Métis people right across Canada and into the United States. Have any of you heard of Franklin's Lost Expedition? And the Métis Connection, this story should fascinate you. We're going to give you a little bit of background information. Franklin's Lost Expedition was a failed British voyage of Arctic exploration, of course, led by Captain Sir John Franklin that departed England in 1845 aboard two ships, HMS Airbus and HMS Terror. The voyage was assigned to really traverse uh, the last unnavigated sections of the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic and to really record magnetic data to help determine whether a better understanding could really aid in navigation. So that was very, very important. And the expedition met with disaster after both ships and their crew, a total of 129 officers and men, became icebound in Victoria Strait near King William Island, in which is today known as Nunavut. And after being Icebound for more than a year, Erebus and Terror were abandoned in April 1848, by which point Franklin and nearly two dozen others had perished. And the survivors, uh, now led by Franklin's second in command, Francis Crozier, and Erebus's captain, James Fitzjames set out for the Canadian mainland and completely disappeared, having presumably perished. And uh, pressed by Franklin's wife, Jane, and others, the Admiralty launched a search for the missing expedition in 1848, and so many other subsequent uh, searches in the decades afterwards. Several relics from the expedition, of course, were uncovered, as well as human remains of men. This is where our Métis connection comes in. This is where our story becomes very, very interesting. And really, it is about William Kennedy and the search for Franklin. And you could certainly say with complete certainty that William Kennedy was a very unusual Métis of his time period, and his claim to fame was not set on the prairies, as most other, a lot of other Métis Legends, Métis stories begin on the prairies, but on the volatile oceans of the unforgiving Canadian North. So again, covering stories right across Canada, different areas in Canada are Métis diversity. William Kennedy, of course, was born at Cumberland House in Saskatchewan, which is a province in Canada, April 1814 to a Cree woman named Agathalus or Margaret Bear, and of course, Alexander Kennedy, who was a Hudson Bay Company post manager. And uh, when William was 13, he was sent to Orkney for his education at St. Margaret's Hope. And in 1836, he entered the employ of the Hudson Bay Company stationed at that time on the 
on Gava Coast, and he did resign in 1846 when his religious convictions led him to disagree with the Hudson Bay Company of uh, selling liquor to Indians. And as a young man at Cumberland House, he had the opportunity around 1819 to, of course, meet Sir John Franklin. And uh, it's interesting to note that only one Canadian-born person William Kennedy, who was, of course, Cree Métis, searched for Franklin during all those years following the expedition's loss in 1848. And to me, and I'm sure to a lot of others, it was completely disheartening to read that some commentaries have questioned whether Kennedy as an indigenous person, was even literate, educated, and to me, that is completely unreal. Again, that is more of the colonial mindset. Uh, William moved to Canada, to the Canadian West in 1848, and he started a fishery at the mouth of the Saguin River and was thus one of the founders of Southampton, which is Canada West. And uh, from 1848 to 1850, he was a captain of a boat on Lake Huron. And in 1850, he offered his services to Lady Franklin to help search for the Franklin expedition. And on suggestion of the ex-chief trader John McLean. Uh, Kennedy was accepted, of course, um, in 1851 by uh, Lady Franklin as the commander of her second private expedition in search of her lost husband. Shortly before the expedition sailed, uh, Kennedy was joined by Joseph Rennie Bellot, a sub-lieutenant in the French Navy, and Franklin had totally insisted on that. And uh, this particular Arctic expedition was one of the best prepared of any up until that time frame. And uh, Kennedy was well acquainted with the perils of the North after his uh, service in Ingava and Lavador, and he really chose a nucleus of men experienced in the Canadian wilds, and he insisted his crew protect themselves with native clothing. And his ship, the 89-ton Prince Albert, uh, had a very shallow drought uh, making it a poor sea vessel, um, but it proved highly maneuverable in the Arctic ice. And, um, well, the expedition did not find Franklin, of course. It did acquire substantial knowledge of the Canadian Arctic. And this was really uh, because of his preparedness, his leadership, uh, adapting the dress and survival techniques of the Inuit's people, and uh, he brought a custom-made kayak for independent travel away from the ship. And the ship also stopped in Greenland to purchase a dog sled team. And I think the most key important element is he asked locals for the best routes and the information of that particular area. October 1852, they returned to uh, Britain uh, without losing any men, and uh, they had the opportunity, of course, uh, to record 
uh, flora and fauna and the cartography of the particular area. And uh, this really, and this is important, was a first for any Arctic exploration to that date. And uh, Lady Franklin placed Kennedy in charge of her auxiliary steamship Isabel to search the Arctic via the Bering Strait early in 1853 as well. And most of the crew, including his sailing master Robert Great, mutinied at uh, Valpera, uh, Valparaiso in August, claiming that the vessel was too small for her mission. And after two years trading around the South American coast while desperately trying to find another crew willing to sail to the Arctic, uh, Kennedy sadly gave up and returned the Isabel to England in 1855. And after returning to England, uh, Captain Kennedy wrote a book about his expedition, and that particular book really earned him further acclaim and public recognition. Uh, the British Historical Society invited him to present his drawings and findings to its members. And can you just picture this as well and uh, just fathom this, that despite 30 search parties sent out to find the lost expedition, the ships the two ships were not found until 2014 and 2016. Even if Kennedy's search of 1851 had looked in the right place, sadly, Franklin had already perished in 1847. And it has been said Kennedy uh, did not find the ships because of the sheer natural power of the North. Simply put, uh, Kennedy could not search southward from uh, Bellout Strait because of an Arctic gale that prevented him from doing so. And Kennedy really realized that Franklin's search for the Northwest Passage was severely hampered by a lack of Indigenous knowledge. And I think that's a key point in regards to uh, the search for uh, the Northwest Passage. And the English ships and their crew really had no wisdom uh, about the lands, waters, winds, and ice that they would encounter on their particular uh, journeys. Did you know that Kennedy visited the Admiralty in the winter of 1851, and he literally demanded that his ship have pemmican uh, to assist, of course, in avoiding scurvy. I didn't know that. And uh, the only alcohol uh, would be used for either lighting purposes and cooking, and uh, that's the only way that he would allow that on the Prince Albert. And he knew the the dangers of alcohol when consumed in the very frigid uh, temperatures. And uh, first published in 1853, a short narrative of the second voyage of the Prince Albert in search of Sir John Franklin was written in the form of a diary. And William Kennedy really describes in detail the most hazardous conditions of the Arctic. And he mentions snow blindness, frostbite, and of course, scurvy. And upon his return to Canada, in 1856, he really became active in establishing a mail service between Toronto and the Red River Colony. And before and after the Lady Franklin expedition, Kennedy wrote several open letters to the Globe newspaper, which were printed and received 
a great deal of attention at that particular time. And these letters question the leaders of Upper and Lower Canada for really enabling the Hudson Bay Company to govern Rupert's land when they really didn't have the legal authority to do so. And Captain Kennedy uh, collaborated with his nephew, uh, Alexander Kennedy Abister, who was a surgeon and a barrister in the British Parliament, and of course was also a former Hudson Bay Company employee, and of course was Métis, and he was also a very staunch critic of that company. And utilizing his access, he was able to directly reference uh, the original uh, company documents in the Parliament's archives, and he was able to determine that the agreement between the magistrate and the Hudson Bay Company granting authority to govern had expired decades earlier, and the Hudson Bay Company authority to govern continually continued solely because it had never been contested. So that's some shady stuff on the side of the Hudson Bay Company in that particular time period. And Kennedy challenged the governing authority of the Hudson Bay Company in the public arena of uh, Canada's media, of course. And on the other hand, Abister, his uh, nephew, challenged it in the arena of the British Parliament. And both Kennedy and Abister risked so much in this particular endeavor. They risked their reputations, of course. They risked their personal safety, their social position, and they utilized their own personal funds to bring this information to the attention of the people. After a decade of petitioning, campaigning, and soliciting the British upper class for support, finally uh, Parliament relented. So choosing to reconstruct instead of, of uh, granting self-government, they united the re regions of Upper and Lower Canada with Rupert's Land, which is now into the country of Canada. By 1860, Captain Kennedy settled at his family home in, of course, the Red River Settlement with his wife, Eleanor Cripps. And Eleanor, of course, was a friend of Lady Franklin. And during this period, he operated a store with his brother George, uh, eventually becoming active in the community, of course, as a magistrate and a member of the Board of Education in the province of Manitoba. Uh, he was invited to present his Arctic findings at the first scientific address of the newly formed Historical and Scientific Society of Manitoba in 1879 as well. By the 1880s, his niece's husband, John Norquay, and I hope a lot of you are familiar with who John Norquay was. He was uh, he went on to be, of course, uh, the premier of Manitoba, uh, and he recruited Captain Kennedy to become an active voice for the development of a railroad from uh, Winnipeg to all the way to Churchill, and this was an important line in uh, the quest to really break the CPR's monopoly chain, uh, the chain supply monopoly over the region. And sadly, he died before the line could be completed. Kennedy, of course, did not, a lot of you may or may not know that, um, know this, that Kennedy, of course, did not participate during the 1869 1870 Red River Rebellion. He was uh, bedridden at that particular time and really, really crippled with arthritis. And uh, it's also interesting to note, going back a little bit in time as well, that during the 1860s, Kennedy uh, 
<clears throat> rebuilt his family home at Red River in so in, in a real Riverstone style, and he named it the Maples. And currently it still exists at the River, Red River House Museum at St. Andrews in Manitoba, and it highlights the unique architecture from the era and showcases his belongings from that particular period. A real Métis fighter to the end, Kennedy died January 25th, 1890. And in his eulogy of Kennedy, Canon Sam Samuel Pritchard Matheson said, and this is very, very important, and it is so telltale, and I quote, he was a man who never got his due, uh, while other men far less deserving received honor and emolument, he was passed over, end of quote. And I think that's very sad and very telltale. All his exploits trying to find Franklin and the lost expedition, trying to uh, work with the CPR, trying to petition against Hudson Bay Company, uh, trying to um, help his people in Red River. And uh, that quote is telltale where he was simply passed over. And this is what the Winnipeg Free Press noted on January 30th, 1890. And I quote, the remains of the late Captain William Kennedy were laid to rest Tuesday in the parish churchyard of St. Andrews. A large number of people of the neighborhood and several from Winnipeg attended the funeral to pay their last tribute of respect to the memory of the deceased. And services were conducted at the family rever 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 residence and at the church by Reverend Canon Matheson and Reverend A.L. 14. And uh, after uh, the burial service at the grave, a prayer, a prayer was offered by Reverend Dr. Bryce. And of course, the ball bearers were Sheriff Inkster, Colonel Bedson, Andrew Strang, George Ross, William Richards, and uh, John uh, Lask. So, of course, again, from the Winnipeg Free Press, January 30th, 1890. During the 1910s, the Women's Canadian Club hosted a ceremony recognizing Captain Kennedy with a placard mounted at the St. Andrews Church. And this particular placard in inscription reads, and I quote, to William Kennedy, Arctic explorer by Sir Ernest Shackleton, the famous Antarctic explorer, end of quote. And Captain William Kennedy House was formally recognized as one of Canada's historic places in 1985, and it is located at 417 River Road in St. Andrews, Manitoba, of course, in Canada. Uh, the other names, of course, uh, Kennedy House, Maple Grove, Maple Grove Tea Room at Kennedy House, and of course, Maple Grove again. So this is where I think we need to pay homage and we need to remember uh, the importance of Captain William Kennedy, who really was a Métis legend from Cumberland House in Saskatchewan. But the story goes far into the Canadian Arctic. And again, he was a Métis, and he was regarded as a hero of the British Empire for his exploits in the Arctic. And he was honored by famed, of course, Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton in 1910. Captain Kennedy's discoveries, his use of native technology, and his conclusion 
that the Northwest Passage might be uneconomical and impractical all really changed prevailing opinions about Arctic exploration. And again, he played a very, very important role in ensuring that the Northwest was acquired by Canada and not the United States. And he and his nephew, Alexander Kennedy Abister, uh, petitioned to the British Parliament on behalf of the people of Red River, and it had the effect of breaking the Hudson Bay Company monopoly rule and bringing more democracy to Red River. So that was an important achievement as well. Captain Kennedy should also be recognized as his role as a peacekeeper. And what I mean by peacekeeper, most notably, it was from his sickbed uh, where he counseled Louis Riel to shed no bloodshed during the resistance of 1869 to 1870. So he played a very, very important role there. And to really undertake voyages into the Arctic at that time with a very, very tiny ship, limited maps, and only his innate skills and intuition to guide him really, really make Captain Kennedy a Métis legend. Our young Métis Indigenous people are really looking for representatives of their history to learn from. And examples like Captain Kennedy are so rare in our history books. And someone who helped to create a province and to help unroll of unroll the map of Canada's north is such a very, very important Métis individual that we need to recognize and to remember. On a closing note of what's happening present right now, uh, as per an August 4th, 2022 article, it's exciting to note that the historic Kennedy House is reopening to the public. And uh, after being closed for six years, the grounds located at 4, 417 River Road in St. Andrews, Manitoba, is once again open for public tours. And this is this makes me happy, this excites me, that they are pleased to offer a Métis interpreter who will be on site sharing stories about Kennedy and sharing stories about his contributions. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. Tours, of course, are free of charge and they're offered five times a week until August 31st, 2022. So I think really the story of Métis Captain William Kennedy and his role in the Lost Franklin expedition, his role in petitioning with his nephew against uh, the Hudson Bay Company and their stranglehold on uh, uh, the people, etc., his uh, really counseling from his sick, sickbed, Louis Riel, about shedding no bloodshed and helping to, of course, break the CPR monopoly. I think he really led a very, uh, a life of legend and a life that should be recognized and it should be shared. And it's something that, you know, a story that we should tell the children. And he again was born April 1814 and passed away January 25th, 1890. And if you have the time and you want to learn more, I encourage you to learn more about Franklin's Lost Expedition. And I thought it was 
absolutely fascinating to learn about this Métis connection. As we mentioned, we think of the Métis on the prairies and uh, to find uh, a Métis involved in Arctic exploration and uh, doing stuff in the Canadian Arctic, I think is absolutely fascinating. So again, I'm your host, Alexandria Anthony. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this journey of exploring Métis hero, Métis legend from right across Canada and into the United States. Until next time, take care and thank you very much.